All right, Joey, what do you say? Yeah, we've uh, we've broken the magic threshold, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, so thank you everyone again for joining us. Uh, this is our ninth webinar in this series. Uh, so we're uh, we're really pleased that we've had such a great turnout. Uh, we do appreciate everyone, uh, especially those of you who have been around for all nine. And I'm looking through the uh, the attendees list, and I think I, I see a few that have been here for most of them. So thanks again. Wow, the nine timers club. That's that's <laughs> impressive. We'll have to get jackets made or something. That's right, special jackets. Uh, so before we get started, as usual, we'd like to go through a little uh, housekeeping. Uh, Mike was mentioning in this earlier before we started is that, you know, we're probably, uh, you know, used three or four different uh, platforms this week. So uh, we want to get everyone reacclimated to go to uh, meeting, go to webinar. So uh, first of all, everyone's in listen only mode. If you have any questions, use the Q&A feature. You can find the Q&A feature by using this little orange uh, arrow that's going to pop out your little control panel. Uh, down here at the bottom is the questions. Just type what you need in there. Uh, you'll also find uh, handouts for this uh, this one. Just just one for you. Uh, light reading this week. Uh, this is going to be the copy of this presentation that we're going through right now. So if you want that as a PDF, you can grab that there. Uh, and then the audio. If you're having any audio issues, I don't see anyone uh, messaging me just yet. But uh, click through this. That's the really the best we can do. We can't. Uh, can't do much on our end for that, so you're you're on your own there. Uh, as usual, keep in mind this webinar is for a general audience. We're going to go into a deep dive on spray foam. We're going to talk about energy codes. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. Some of it might be over your head. Uh, some of it might be right in your wheelhouse, but I'm sure everyone will learn something. Uh, and as always, uh, send us your feedback. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, some uh, topics that we might talk about in the future. So, uh, you know, if you have any other ideas, we uh, always um, welcome those. And, and Joey, do you want to just mention that, you know, that this was our last one, but we sort of got a, you know, a, a stay of execution? Or... <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, the ninth and final one for this uh, series. Uh, the plan oh, is... Yeah, the, the plan is to probably continue uh, doing a monthly series after this, and we'll talk about the dates uh, uh, as uh, I think we have a slide toward the end. Uh, basically, it's going to be uh, every third Thursday the same time, and we've got a few topics in mind. So We do. We're excited. Um, without further ado, I'll introduce myself. I'm Joey Starr. I'm a technical project manager here at South Face. I work primarily uh, in on training, uh, weatherization, building science, uh, you name it, and also some other projects uh, that South Face has going on. Yeah, and I'm Mike Barsick. Welcome, and again, thanks everybody who's been participating in these. Uh, we really appreciate it. There's our emails. Um, have gotten some great commentary and great questions and stuff, so feel free to take advantage of that. Um, and uh, again, I come at the world from the mechanical engineering side of things, but have uh, had my share of construction experience too. Um, I was going through some photos um, probably looking for spray foam photos this week, but I found a, a picture of me wearing a wig um, in a costume party. And I thought, I bet there's a picture of Joey out there wearing a wig. And sure enough, there it was. So, yep. <laughs> you got the short end of the stick this, this week. That's, that's, uh, it, right? that's it. That's it. Uh, anyway, welcome. And thanks again to everybody for participating. Um, definitely excited and uh, really appreciate those folks who have been supporting South Face through this time because uh, this this has been these webinars are unfunded, so um, uh, definitely uh, appreciate that. And some folks have signed up for the continuing ed credits and signed up for you know the the online content that we're trying to develop more and more of. So really appreciate your help on that. Um, also, we've been working with an organization called EVA, which I've talked about before, the Energy. Uh, and oh, what's it called? Energy and uh, now I can't believe I can't remember the acronym. Energy efficient, uh, energy and environmental builders alliance. Wow, that was hard to come out. Um, oops, lost my screen, but it's back. And we're going to do a course for them, which I've been doing this for the last several years. Um, and they're going to bring it online, and they're going to offer it for free. Uh, if you want to earn a credential, you can actually earn the HERS associate credential. Um, that is uh, going to be happening. It starts next Thursday, so we're going to do it every Thursday for mostly June and the in the beginning of July. And if any of those topics look interesting to you, and if you take all the 
the webinars and pass the test, I think it's uh, I think it's like they're only charging 39 bucks and you can earn a credential called HERS Associate. Uh, and th the topics, I think some of this content we've covered in great detail on this webinar series, um, building science and uh, indoor air quality in particular, but there's some that we haven't really covered. Uh, we're gonna go into a deeper dive onto energy codes and energy modeling, as well as what HERS raters do and, and how that can help you. So that might, I just wanted to put a plug for that out there and I get to be the instructor, so I'm excited. Uh, and I think it looks like it's gonna be three o'clock Eastern, no wait, is that one o'clock or three o'clock? Um, one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. <laughs> no, no, you no, went the wrong direction. That. I did. I got that wrong. It's 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 Alabama time. So that's how I what, remember. What is time, Mike? Uh, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Joey. I'm rambling on though. Um, so anyway, take advantage of that if you're interested. And um, Joey, I'm assuming we've. This is typically who we hear from. If you are listening and you are not one of these entities, let us know. We want we want to know who you are. Um, anything you want to add on that, my friend? Um, we have a, a couple of. A guest. I don't know if you want to mention that now or let's do that. Go ahead. Let's do that. <laughs> um, we we want to thank it. And we we've um, asked them to take lots of copious notes of all the many mistakes that I say. But we've asked um, our friends uh, with a spray foam uh, manufacturer with Isonine La Jolla that uh, my friend Phil Brown and my friend Randy Nicholas, who I've known for years, have been a great technical resource. So we figured we'd get questions at the end. And we're going to ask them to comment at the end and be available for questions. So thanks to, to those folks. And thank you, Joey, for remembering to introduce them. All right, driving on. Um, again, as always, take advantage of some of the good free information that um, I don't know where it is now on our website, but I think you can still find it, particularly the field guide, which has some good graphics in it, um, good pictures in it. Yeah, that's and, a good point, Mike. We actually just redesigned our website. I believe these links will still work. Let me see if I can try this on my other screen. Yeah, yeah. if not, it's going to be under resources. And yeah, you should be able to find it. It's actually pretty, the new uh, website is actually a little bit more intuitive, I think. So just go really? to South, <laughs> South Bay resources and then Georgia Energy Code resources. Yeah, actually yeah. that previous link will still work. And also... Uh, there's a big uh, big heading for building science webinars. So, um, you know, if you happen to lose our emails or anything like that, you can always find uh, the webinar series right there, which is nice. Definite new look and feel. Um, under resources, the pull down is a library tab, and then it's got, I, I went there and clicked on assessment. And I wanted to mention this one document, which is honestly the ugliest document I think that's on there. So apologies for that. It just has never gotten blitzed up, but it's energy and water project uh, checklist of things that if you're going to have this done on your building, these are things, questions you should ask. And one of them is retrofitting spray foam uh, insulation along the roof line. And there's some other ones in there, too. I think it's a great document that will just sort of bring up a lot of the issues that we're going to mention today. Um, so I think hopefully we made a good case for why building science is so important. And what's fun is having gotten through the fundamentals, now we're really able to apply it to certain situations. In this case, uh, high performance insulated roof lines. Again, we're always trying to push the systems approach to a house and the components that make up the envelope and make up the system and how they interact. And of course, don't forget the people aspect of all this. Um, our, our learning objectives, as always, so we can give you continuing ed credits, but ultimately, we're really going to focus on, that looks like bread, doesn't it? We're going to focus mm -hmm. on um, on ways to do uh, insulated roof lines, and um, one of them is spray foam, but there are other ways as well. And we're going to kind of dive in, talking about ceilings in general, and so I want to do a quick review of this project, which I think, again, we talked in great detail, but you know, the sun is radiating heat down to the shingles. They absorb heat, they conduct because they're solid and the wood decking is solid, they conduct through. The underside of the wood decking is very hot. It emits heat by radiation down to all the other surfaces. The other surfaces uh, start to warm up and particularly the air molecules around the, the flat insulation and the framing and the what were we thinking, ductwork 
uh, all the air temperature starts to, to, to increase. And of course, warm air wants to rise up, so we give it a pathway to vent out. And if a cubic foot of air leaves, it has to be replaced by a cubic foot of air coming in. So um, that, of course, is convective cooling. That's what happens in a conventional attic on a hot day. That's the, the flow of heat. And we, um, we also talked, I think this was a great diagram that, that um, uh, we talked about this, how we could increase the amount of convective cooling in an attic with a fan, but really that's just spending money to treat the symptom, which is the air got hot, not the way the heat got into the attic. Um, and ultimately, no matter what, uh, you know, the ducts are still in a hot space being radiated by hot surfaces and the <clears throat> fan itself doesn't discriminate. So it can pull the attic under a negative pressure and actually pull lots of conditioned air up into the attic. So we really don't want to do that. So I'm going to jump to the, almost the same slide. Joey came up with this drawing last week. I really like it because it says from an envelope standpoint, it looks so simple, right? Just run the insulation up the wall, run the insulation across the ceiling and back down the wall. But the reality is it's not so simple. And um, there are lots and lots of places where there are penetrations, there are leak paths, there is not complete coverage of the insulation. And so there are all the faulty issues that, that sort of work into this. And <clears throat> what we're talking about is more of a game changer where we're gonna say, you know what, I give up. It's just too hard to do that well. And let me see, we're gonna go to something like this, where we're going to change the way we define our building thermal envelope. It's actually gonna increase the surface area of the thermal envelope, which in itself might seem like a bad idea because it's more surface to have heat transfer through. But ultimately, um, the net gain is, is several things, but one being that the ducts are brought inside. And you'll notice that probably while it's possible to do this approach and still vent the roof, I, I'm gonna say I really question, and many others do too, the merit of venting a ceiling when there's no attic space. So let me just be clear, if there's a flat ceiling, go ahead and vent it. Vent it, if there's an attic space, go ahead and vent it, just follow the code. It's not gonna work or it's not gonna do much good, but you know, just do it, follow the code. It does do good in a, cold climate in terms of letting uh, moisture that would essentially escape into the attic, not condense on the cold roof deck. The venting does help that problem. So go ahead and vent. But uh, when you do an insulated roof line, I really question the merit or the value of venting. And, and I'm not the only one. So I think in general, we're going to push you not to vent in that situation. Um, I thought I'd show this. Um, <laughs> Is there any way we could screw this up, Joey? What do you think of this? What do you think? What, I was hoping someone would laugh when they saw this picture. So can you cue the laugh track for that? So what's wrong with this picture, Joey? I don't know. Hmm. It looks like maybe we have uh, penetrated our air barrier just a, a wee little bit here. Yeah, I think uh, hopefully that's obvious why this is not a, a good scene. If we foam the roof line and then... Uh, so you never want to vent underneath your insulation. So hopefully we've we've clarified that. We've got at least one um, person laughing in yep. the in the questions. Two people laughing. All thank right. Thank you for laughing. Thank you. you. You get bonus points for that. So thank you. Um, okay. So um, I had that in my files. I had to pull that out. So um, the thermal boundary. I think we've covered this in great detail, but it's really about consistent and continuous coverage of the insulation, and, as well as the air barrier. And of course, when we get to a flat ceiling. We can choose, or we get to an attic space, we can choose to do the flat ceiling, the floor of the attic, or we can choose to insulate the roof line. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, once again, these are all allowed by code. We can, we are not required to do example one. We can choose to cathedralize the roof line or parts of the roof line. In this case, they still have an attic space. Um, and in this case, they just said, why don't we just continue it all the way down? And honestly, I probably would recommend that for this house as well, even though this is the only cathedralized part that you actually see. Um, and we'll, we'll go into great detail, but all of these are allowed by code. And in general, the ones um, where we're running it along the roof line are going to perform the best because mainly because the ducts are inside. Thought we'd review what the code has to say about this. So we're gonna step back. We're gonna look at first flat ceilings with attic spaces. And so prescriptive R values in the codes today are pretty high for the ceiling, uh, mainly because uh, it's pretty easy to stand there and blow more 
fiberglass or cellulose on top of what's already there or you know just stand there a little longer so um, pretty high prescriptive r values uh, climate zone two and three are r38 climate zone four and up is r49 uh, Georgia made a couple amendments. We're just 38 for the whole state, but you know, uh, pretty high insulation values. I also want to make sure everybody understands that um, those are assumed. The 38 or the 49 are assumed to be tapered. So the code actually has a provision that says if instead of doing a tapered R38, if you can do a continuous R30, you're deemed to comply. You're still prescriptive. And likewise, if you're in a cold climate. You're supposed to do 49, but it's tapered. They'll let you get away with a 38 continuous. This is not me making this up. This is in the, the national code. Um, so it kind of gives you a sense of the impact of tapering insulation and what you know what the code is sort of saying, a built-in deemed to comply path. I think everybody's up on the whole ruler detail. We talked about this extensively in the insulation uh, webinar. And, and some states have some uh, specific amendments. Georgia has one that says, you know what? just if you're you're insulating a flat ceiling and you have one sheet of osb up there for a mechanical system as long as it's at least r19 we're not going to make you do a trade-off so um just an example of a state amendment also eve baffles pretty consistent between the national code and georgia on this the one thing that georgia has different is we have a provision that the you still have to have a dam for the blown insulation you still have to have a baffle we're just saying it's got to terminate at least four inches above the top of the, the ceiling uh, the insulation level okay let's talk about ceilings without an attic okay ceilings without an attic by code um, if you're going to do a little bit of vault you know let's just say you're vaulting part of your master suite um, uh, if you don't have enough room for whatever your prescriptive code is let's say 38 the co the the uh, energy code has a built-in as long as you can get at least r30 and the amount of ceiling is limited to 500 square feet or 20 percent whichever is less um we're not going to make you do a trade-off so it, it, you're able to be prescriptive with a little bit of vault um, nobody has to do a trade-off if you tried to do all your vault is r30 you would have to do a trade-off and this this exception only applies to staying in the prescriptive path so i'm going to refer back to the code on that um how do you do this well you can still do it what i call the old school way which is you know, people putting in vent baffles and running typically fiberglass bats underneath or netting it or something and running it up uh, along the roof line. And I'm going to say that the, the baffle is there, the vent channel is there mainly to deal with moisture. And a lot of times it hasn't been done well. And we've seen a lot of screw ups with this. Not so much on the moisture side, some for sure on the moisture side, but a lot of times uh just it, it really fails from an energy performance standpoint so if you're going to do it right and this is a diagram from georgia georgia's current code so that's why we put it in here you have to put a dam at the bottom of the bat and you have to have a channel that runs all the way up to the ridge vent and even still i wouldn't recommend it it's just not my you're, you're giving up an inch inch and a half for this vent baffle um personally I would rather do a uh, rigid foam board and not vent the roof, which we'll talk about that in a second. But this is allowed. You are allowed. This is, you know, probably a lot of builders in cold climates are still doing this. Uh, but I don't think it's the, and while it passes code and it may get by with moisture, it doesn't usually perform well from an energy standpoint. So the, uh, it's not really the new system anymore. It was new 20 years ago, but the, the new approach, if you will, is to use a spray polyurethane foam up against the underside of the roof deck and the code allows this um, and here's just a, a picture of it and in georgia we have some minimums we have in essence a backstop table and the minimum th that you can trade it down to you don't you don't have to do a full r38 but you have to do at least r20 so the minimum of r20 is still in effect um, and uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that, but you know that can be open or closed cell, and um, we'll, we'll get into the details. Uh, it, the other option is what I call a hybrid approach, and it and it's it's still notice that of course that this is an unvented roof line assembly where it's all using, and the code doesn't actually say spray foam or fiberglass. The code breaks the world up into what they call 
air permeable and air impermeable. Air permeable is fiberglass cellulose, air impermeable is things like rigid foam board or spray polyurethane foam. So the code says if you want to do a hybrid approach on an unvented vaulted assembly, for example, um, depending on your climate zone, you need, and I like to use the word condensation break. It's not, a, it's not a thermal break so much as it is a condensation prevention break. And so in climate zone three, it's an R5. In climate zone four, it's an R15. Okay, and, and um, here's a picture of what that might look like. You could do a, a board that is continuous uh, and then you put roof decking on top of it. You could also put the decking first and then the board on top of that. There's some products called nail base that you can do stuff like that in. And then you fill the cavity. And in Georgia, you have to fill it with at least R20. Um, uh, probably more common would be to put, let's say a rigid foam board between the rafters and then you would seal that, you have to seal it. That's really important. If you don't, you can have condensation failure, but you would seal that and then you would put a bat underneath. So either way, you're kind of giving up, let's say an inch for an R5. Um, I would rather do this, frankly, than have a vent baffle. Um, you know, venting that roof to me doesn't provide a benefit and now this will prevent condensation. Notice that if you're in climate zone four or higher, go back to the chart here, uh, it's significantly more because you do run into issues with uh, hybrid systems. You want to make sure you're not going to hit a dew point in your assembly. So um, that's enough said on that. We'll, we won't go too deep on that right now. Um, uh, I think this is a great approach. Uh, I don't see it being done a lot, but I do think it can work. Um, you got to get the details right. And again, that um, rigid foam board needs to be sealed in here. We're going to make a pitch later for another way to get that R5 or whatever it is is to spray, for example, closed cell foam and then come back with insulation. So for example, if I sprayed an inch of closed cell foam and that gives me an R6-ish or something, and I come back with an R30 bat underneath, I'm now really close to hitting the prescriptive code. And so that's a way, if you wanna hit the prescriptive code uh, or close to it, you're, not, um, you're, you're kind of getting the best of all worlds. Um, so I also wanted to throw another way of doing it, and we're gonna talk more about this, but this is a project I worked on, and you just have to believe me, it was a huge uh, vented attic roof. I mean, when I say huge, you got to understand these walls were probably at least 10 feet tall, and um, it had a vented soffit and ridge vent at the top. Inside on the flat ceiling, it was a flat ceiling in the entire building. It was a drop ceiling, grid ceiling tile system. And Joey, how, how airtight do you think that was? <laughs> I would say probably not very. Not very. And guess what? When this system operated, it was uh, the ducts were, of course, in now a vented, humid attic space. Lots of energy loss from that. Um, the the air ceiling, air barrier was horrible. So so much conditioned air went out the ridge vent. Joey, the lawn guys on a hot day, they would come stand over here because there was a a, a, um, a soffit vent, and they would just feel the cold air blowing on them. So they really liked it but you know basically air conditioning in atlanta so to retrofit this with spray foam from underneath would have been a big challenge because it would have interrupted their actual activities and also it was a very high ceiling um and they would have had to have a scaffolding and um and, and it turns out the roof itself was failing so they were going to get a new roof and we said and and we've worked a lot with the salvation army i think they trust us and they we've we've got a good track record with helping them save real energy and so we went with a rigid foam uh, board on the top of the roof decking. So the old roofing was pulled off. Um, I want to say four or six inches of rigid foam insulation was put down, probably new decking and, and a metal roof came on top of that. And uh, they, it was expensive, obviously a big upgrade, but they saw the energy benefits immediately, just dramatic reduction in, because they're no longer heating and cooling Atlanta. And they and they are going to own and operate this building for a long, long time. So they saw the value of a, a durable metal roof. So great, great. Uh, just another way of kind of getting to the finish line. And one more thing I want to mention, and this is new in the 2018 IRC. It, it was uh, deleted in Georgia, and I don't necessarily have a problem with that. Um, but it is new, and I want to say I think the specs are sound on this. I do think that it is valid. But um, I, I question the efficacy in the real world. Uh, but the idea is, could I use, for example, fiberglass or cellulose or netted or bats 
without the condensation break. And what happens is we've seen this in cold climates and other places that moisture will tend to build up and work its way up to the ridge. And the idea was instead of a, an air open ridge vent, we're gonna cut an opening, it looks like a ridge vent. We're gonna seal it with an air barrier material that is very vapor open. And you describe that and you go, well, that sounds a lot like a house wrap. So we're using a product like a very vapor open house wrap at the top that is still gonna be airtight. So it's airtight, but water vapor can diffuse out of it. And then we're gonna put essentially a, a ridge, you know, cap ridge vent system on top. So if any vapor builds up in the insulation, it rises to the top and it can diffuse out and then air through the ridge vent will pick it up. So it's still an airtight assembly. I think if you really follow the details that it would work. I'm going to say that, but I and many others in the building science world kind of just question whether is this something roofers can pull off because they're just not used to air sealing. And I and I question. I think it's if you get the details right, this could work. So I want to see uh, a thousand buildings that have had this that have been proven not to fail before I'm going to try it. Um, or you know, if I'm going to try it, I want to do it for you know scientific purposes. And it has been done a little bit, but I want to see a, a much bigger thing before I feel good about recommending it. So I, that's kind of I want people to be aware of that. That is in the IRC. If you're on the national level, Georgia took it out. Um, so you could appeal to the code official, but um, at the end too, it, it does also say, you know, we want you to condition this and it talks about air impermeable, well, that'd be spray foam. It says, we do think conditioning the attic is a good idea. So I meant to mention that I'm an advocate, I'd say, of conditioning the attic. Even, I uh, used to say indirectly, now I think a little bit of direct conditioning is a good thing. Not much. All right, Joey, what do you want to say about trade-offs? Uh, well, this is my big contribution to the to the slides. R20 is less than R38. Uh, <laughs> I get into a lot of arguments with spray foam uh, people that you know they they spray foam the attic and then they wonder why they have to do trade offs. The fact of the matter is, you know, we'll talk about the benefits of spray foam and a, a foam roof line, but uh, you know, if you think about heat transfer, R20 is just simply less than R38. So you have to kind of make up that uh, somewhere agree. else in the house. I agree. I agree. And um, which is why I, I would, I'm projecting here, but I'm guessing you'd probably be more an advocate of a, of a um, hybrid approach. Is that a fair statement? We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll see. Oh, OK. Maybe not. All right. So <laughs> and it's all right. You can have opinions on this. It's really OK. I did want to mention, too, that, again, this backstop table that that Georgia has specifically put in. So you can use all these different methods of a trade-off, but no matter what, an individual component cannot be worse than something. And you're gonna have to trade off something usually to put this in. So for example, walls, uh, there's no reason a framed wall should not be R13. Um, and in an attic, if you've got an attic space, we're gonna let you trade it down a little bit, but no less than R30. Um, if you're gonna do a air impermeable spray foam roof line, R20 is the minimum you can go to. If you're gonna do a vented, you know, bat on a vault, R20 is the minimum you can do. And if you're gonna do the unvented um, air permeable insulation, you still have to have that condensation break that I mentioned. So um, this is the worst uh, an individual component could actually be under the R code. What is the impact on low caps? Well, I thought this was interesting because, and first of all, you know, that pie chart, represents somebody's home but every home is different every home is unique this is probably more of an existing home because you can see that air leakage and duct leakage are pretty significant and that's 45 percent of the total energy load of the house um, is is due to the air leakage the duct leakage four percent is due to the fact that the ducts are outside the envelope they're in a say a hot attic or a crawl space and then the ceiling itself is also a contributor. So if we choose to kind of go after the roof line, we are impacting the ceiling load, we are impacting the air leakage, we are impacting the fact that the ducts would now potentially leak to inside the envelope and that the duct loss and gain is essentially nil because they're inside condition space. So we have a big impact on the loads if we you know, sort of redraw our envelope. However, in theory, if you, if you think about it, like you said, um, well, we've got uh, about half the R value that we would have had, so that should take a hit. 
And we also have increased the surface area. If we run insulation along the roof line, um, we, we're, we're, you know, if it's a thousand square foot roof and it's got an 812 pitch straight gable, that's another 20% surface area plus the gable walls. So you're, you know, you're looking at 1,200 square feet that's only R20 versus a thousand square feet that's R38. So yeah, you're like, okay, that that's going to affect the load. And the other thing is that, oh no, now you've made my house tight. I have to account for fresh air as part of my load count, which you should probably do anyway. But you can say all of these are going to increase the load, and that's absolutely correct. However, the net effect is almost always a, a decrease in HVAC size. Uh, foaming the roof line <clears throat> is going to have a big impact, uh, and the main reasons are um, the infiltration is usually dramatically tighter. Uh, not the only way to get a tight house, but for example, if we foam the roof line, we're going to get a tighter house, usually. Um, the inf insulation coverage is, is potentially better because there's not as many things in the way. There's not as many penetrations. There's not as many, uh, there's not duct work blocking where insulation should be, for example. Um, and then this is me kind of trying to hand wave here, but I always felt like it was a dirty little secret of the in industry, the insulation industry, that they rate their products at a temperature where I could not care less how they perform. So we're going to give it an R value at 75 degrees, but I want to know how does it perform at zero degrees and how does it perform when it's really hot. So I'm going to ask Randy and Phil to have that fixed for the entire industry of insulation by next week. So that's on your to-do list. Um, <clears throat> The main benefit, of course, ducts and equipment are inside the thermal envelope. And now instead of being um, random air changes providing fresh air, which was uncontrolled and generally way high, now we have a known fresh air source and we might even do an energy recovery on that. So in, at the end effect is we're going to almost always see that the load gets smaller uh, when we foam a roof line, for example. And again, why? Uh, problems like this. The coverage is not consistent. The air barrier is not necessarily good. The, the air barrier and the insulation are not in contact with each other. The coverage of consistency, uh, Joey, you want to take this one? You kind of talked about yeah. this. Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about this as a thousand square foot attic, so, you know, medium sized home, even 3% of the insulation coverage is an R1. So we could say maybe that's the attic hatch itself, and then maybe a few can lights is an R1. Uh, that's going to give the same amount of heat transfer as an R18. So if you had a spray wow. foam roof line, which was an R R20 or so, but it, it was 100% complete coverage, it would actually perform better than the R38, uh, even if the R38 was only deficient at 3%. So, great, great point, great point. So you know, again, heat is like you and me; it takes the path of least resistance. <laughs> um, and also, of course, all the air sealing details that we have to get right, some of them being very small and meticulous, some of them being giant chases like you see there. Um, so let's talk about spray foam. Uh, again, I think, I know I'm kind of circling in the, 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 the details. I feel like I keep coming back to these, but again, it's allowed by code. We can define the envelope differently. We can choose to make it along the roof line instead of the flat ceiling. Um, the big performance advantage is, again, the consistent coverage, the air tightness, and that mainly the ducts and mechanicals are inside the envelope. All right. All right. This is me. I'm going to give my version at the end. They're going to correct all my mistakes. Um, and uh, Spray polyurethane foam is basically interesting because it's one of the few building products that's actually made on the job site. It's manufactured right there in the house, and it's manufactured by heating up two chemicals and pressurizing them and spraying them through a nozzle where an A and a B chemical mix and they need to mix at a one-to-one -one ratio and the A chemical is pretty much the same for everybody it's an isocyanate and it's there's only a few manufacturers I think of this in the in the country so it's that's the same for everybody and the B chemical is proprietary to the individual manufacturer it usually contains things like some kind of a catalyst it's got petroleum um, it's got a surfactant, it's got a blowing agent, um, and then maybe some fire retardant and maybe some kind of coloring. So it's, you know, whatever color they want to make it. Um, and they're mixed and um, we'll get into more of the details about it being done correctly. There's really, in the residential world at least, there's really just two types of spray foam and it's the same chemicals. It's just um, the mixing and the blowing agent really is what's different. So 
open cell, I want to say it sprays on like spray paint. It expands to a hundred times. It's and I think closed cells maybe thirty times. So open cell is called low density um, or half pound per cubic foot. That's how much a, a cubic foot would weigh is a half a pound. Um, it's going to come in at about the same R value as conventional insulation products. R three and a half, R three point seven per inch in that ballpark. So a two by four cavity filled with open cell foam is going to be an R thirteen, just like it would be with cellulose and fiberglass. It's a squishy one. You can it feels kind of like sponge cake. Um, it's also very uh, vapor open, meaning uh, water vapor can easily diffuse through it. And I believe if there's a roof leak, liquid water can actually drip through it. It, it, it will actually let liquid water pass through it. I don't know how easily, but, you know, so it, it, it's, it's much more water open. And in fact, water is actually used as the blowing agent. Um, so the guy is wearing a suit and, a and, and masked up and everything, and that's for his safety because that's during the manufacturing process. But it very quickly, essentially, you know, off gases. And then uh, 24 hours later, it should be safe for people to go in without any of this equipment. And, um, and I'll let our experts reveal if maybe that should be 48 or whatever. But, um, you know, that uh, it, it off gases very quickly and then there's not much left over. If it's done right, there really shouldn't be much in the way of, of off gassing problem. It's also a lower cost because the chemicals um, essentially go farther, if you will. So closed cell is the alternative. It's a higher density. Um, product. It's going to have, um, it's, it, it says high, it could be medium density, but it's two pound per cubic foot is typically what you see in the residential world. I think they have some higher ones in commercial applications. It's in the ballpark of R6 ish per inch. So, you know, to get a, to get an R20 for open sale, you're looking at, let's say, five and a half, six. Hey, Mike. Inches for closed cell, you're probably looking at about three-ish inches um, to get an R20. Did you lose me? Yeah, for a minute there. I think I think you're back. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's fine now. Am I back? All I, right. Sorry about that. So, so I wrapped my knuckles to say it was solid. Did you hear that? I um, no, definitely I didn't hear that. I can jump over if necessary. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, no, it's good. Oh yeah, well that was my um, comment. And um, uh, anyway, it, I'm I'm kind of reading and describing, but ultimately it does have a much lower vapor permeability. At the end of the day, it is um, less than one is pretty typical, so it'd be considered a class two vapor retarder, I think, by code. Um, and it historically has had HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, as a blowing agent. That's not so great for the uh, the ozone layer. And I think they're switching. I think Randy was saying HFOs is some of the newer blowing agents. Um, it definitely costs more because you're using more of the chemicals, and the chemicals are the expensive part here. But interestingly, it has this other side benefit of where it actually adds structural benefit. And I, I found a thing that said in the neighborhood of 30%. So I know the manufacturing home industry, housing industry uses it. You know, they'll they'll frame their um, roof assembly and they'll spray closed cell foam because it actually gives them a structurally more um, a stronger roof. So some nice benefits in that regard. Um, let me click on, am I still there, Joey? Can you still yep. hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Good. Um, uh, just to be clear, both are classified at the specified thickness um, of being considered an air barrier. So this is a material that is both an insulator and an air barrier, kind of like foam board. Um, and when they're spray applied, they generate heat. So they're exothermic. And that actually, to some extent, provides a limit of how much you can spray in a single lift or a pass. Uh, with open cell, I think you can do a two by six um, depth. Uh, I know you can do a two by four. With closed cell, generally, you want to hold off to about, um, I would say, probably about a two inch lift. Um, Energy and Environmental Building Alliance. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate that. Luis is um, spamming me here. Yeah. Um, they changed their name. It's not all my fault. Um, okay. Uh, the other good thing is um, uh, that I think you. I think I generally, at least in our let's say mixed humid climate zones, I, I'm talking about hot mixed humids. I usually would say open cell makes sense if you're going to do walls. I think there's a lot of ways to insulate walls. Open cell works pretty well on the on the roof line. 
Um, I would usually say anything with a foundation wall, I'm gonna go closed cell. And closed cell, you can probably apply it anywhere. Also, I think closed cell is more appropriate for a, a hybrid approach, like a flash and bat. And that's what you see in this picture. This is from uh, a, a house that, I wanna say it's in a cold climate, and I think their ductwork is not in the attic. So they said, okay, we're gonna come and we're gonna lay down a layer of roughly an inch of closed cell foam everywhere. Here you can see they had a nice detail with attic uh, uh, dams at the soffit, and there's the vent baffles. You know, they really did these details well, and there's no ductwork in this space. And they're gonna come back and blow a whole bunch of loose fill insulation here. What a great system. And, you know, you kind of squeeze the economics of using the, the spray foam to, to an advantage. So I think a, a flash and bat or a hybrid flash and blow is, is a neat concept. Um, okay, Joey, uh, I wanted to also say with spray foam, because it is, is a significantly more expensive insulation product, it's hard to economically justify, you know, spraying a whole lot more insulation because the point, ins all insulation has this thing called the point of diminishing returns, which is basically, you know, every time you double the R value, you more or less have doubled the cost, but you only cut the remaining heat flow in half. So you, you, you know, you, we talk about what happens when you have R, R0 and you go to R10, you have a huge impact. You go from R10 to R20, you got a decent impact. You go from R20 to R30, you're starting to really kind of, you know, rub up against diminishing returns. You go, for, and it depends on where you are. Um, R30 to R40, uh, we're starting to get there, really cold climate, R50, it's kind of, there's a point at which you should spend money somewhere else. You should stop spending money on flat ceiling insulation and you should put on solar panels or anything better, put on a more efficient mechanical system. Um, so, you know, it's really about sort of the economic of spreading the wealth around intelligently. Uh, and, I, I, you know, here's a, a chart I found that, but it just, if you look at open cell at about four inches, and you go, okay, I'm gonna go to six inches. You know, we've got about a 2% increase in, you know, from about 96% to about 98%. And uh, and again, it's just hard to justify going all the way to R40, for example. Anything you wanna comment on that, Joey? I wanna give you point counterpoint on this. <laughs> no, no, that uh, sounds good to me. Yeah, okay. And, and again, this is where I think a hybrid system is an interesting idea. So best practice, we're gonna pay attention to the junctions. We're gonna look at, and that's particularly the, the ridge and uh, down at the eave. Um, I'm gonna, if I'm doing this on my house, I'm gonna, even if I have to pay a little extra, I want the rafter tails covered because the rafter tails are sort of the weak conductive link in this assembly. So I, I want the rafter tails covered. Um, that's not necessarily a code requirement, but that's something I want. And even a little bit is a, is a nice thermal break. And the main thing is I wanna test and I wanna check for the, the um the depth that i'm going to find and i always ask the installer ahead of time what is the minimum amount of insulation depth i'm going to see i don't tell them the answer i want them to tell me what the answer is and they say okay it's five and a half fine when i go up here and i take a bamboo skewer and i start poking around um, you're going to come back and fix any place that's not five and a half so i, I want to establish up front what that depth should be joey i think this is one that you you mentioned last time you want to just quickly touch yeah, on so it? just a continuation if you weren't here last week um you know just because you put your duct system up in the conditioned attic and you know it's 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 definitely better thermally you don't want to uh forget about the other fundamentals you want to make sure it's still sealed uh and you want to make sure it's still insulated even if it's just a little bit to prevent it from sweating you don't want to have any sharp turns uh and you want to do uh, appropriate support so uh just yeah. keep that in mind you know it's not a uh, you don't get a get out of jail free card just because you put the ducks in the attic. So there's still ways to, you know, man will find a way to screw it up. That's that's what we're saying. So, yeah. And also, I think the inspection part is really critical, too. Um, and 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 you and I have unfortunately seen and maybe you have too, Joey, my fair share of bad spray foam jobs. And and, you know, when when spray foam hit Atlanta, there was one company doing it. And some of those guys are on the line at the end of the day. and their installers were well trained. It was a premium product, and everybody did a good job. Uh, today, it's kind of it's a commodity. It's a wild west out there, and uh, you want to make sure you're getting what you're paying for because you're paying a lot. 
So, and then that's the same is true of any insulation. Um, we want to install it properly, but you know, I've seen um, ridge vents where I could see daylight coming through. I, I've seen places I could I literally run my hand along the edge of the rafter and I'm, my fingertips are touching the roof decking. And it's like, that's not what you paid for. So, um, so we're gonna uh, make sure we inspect and verify and blower door test and infrared test, whatever we need, at least do some depth tests. And I also wanted to mention if you have an existing home uh, for air quality reasons, I want you to get rid of the old flat ceiling insulation. It has nothing to do, it's not a thermal issue, but if you can imagine that for 30 years that that fiberglass insulation or cellulose or rock wool, whatever, you know, critters died in it and peed in it and pooped in it and whatever, and it didn't matter because it was outside your air barrier. And now all of a sudden you wanna put a put that stuff in a plastic bag and stick your head in the bag with it, that doesn't sound healthy. So I'm gonna say vacuum out, budget in the cost of vacuuming out the old insulation and it's strictly for indoor air quality. Um, I'll fight you on that one till the day is long. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joey, we we have seen failures with spray foam. What are some things that can go wrong? Yeah, so uh, I would say, like you said, you know, initially a lot of folks, you know, were well trained. Um, manufacturers required training to use the product, but now at some at some point, you know, it became this commodity where everyone, you know, all you need to do is buy the truck and then you can you can spray it. Uh, so we have a, a a gap in our knowledge base, a gap in our training. Uh, and it usually leads to to one of these three things and, and probably many more that I, I didn't put in here just to be fair. But improper ratio of the, the blowing agents, uh, the temperature, both of the product and of just the environment, you know, just like house paint or anything else, it really should be installed at a certain temperature. And if it's too cold or too hot, you're going to have some issues. And then just the substance. And I think it's 40 degrees. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Keep going. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. I, I and and I, I would guess that would depend on the the manufacturer, but for, that seems right to me. Um, and then substrate compatibility. It, it won't stick to everything. It'll stick to most things, but it, it won't stick. It won't stick to everything. And you need to make sure, uh, you know, especially if you're doing this on a um, uh, you know, a retrofit job that, you know, the, the, the material is clean and it doesn't have a lot of sheetrock dust or, you know, fiberglass dust or whatever on it, because that could potentially affect it. And I would say the, the main failure I see is more about consistent coverage. Uh, I don't know if that's been your experience, Joey, um, but uh, that, that seems to be what we're looking at here is just the lack of consistent coverage. And, and I, I went, uh, a friend of mine had a house that he was getting spray foamed and he asked me to look at it and you could just tell when the one guy quit and the other guy took over. And I said, well, this side over here looks fantastic. I would have him absolutely come back and respray the entire master bedroom side because it looks just terrible. So um, the, the consistent, uh, and again, that has a lot to do with training. So yeah, very, very good. Um, uh, also, I'm gonna try to explain this. Um, and this is my layman's definition of it. This is not the energy code, this is fire code issues. There's two things that come into play. One is called an ignition barrier. The other is called a thermal barrier, and it's not the same thermal that Joey and I like to talk about. Um, I think it has to do with it uh, getting near a hot surface. So the ignition barrier, it's good news is today, almost all the, the products on the market can satisfy that. Um, that would be an open cell, uh, all closed cell foams, but most of the open cell products can make that work. And then the thermal barrier default is basically a half inch of drywall between the foam and the occupants. So if the insulation, for example, is spray foamed on um, a flat ceiling and your ceiling is, you know, drywall, no problem. You got it. You're, you're covered there. But if you do along the roof line and you want to count the flat ceiling, your drywall as your separation barrier, um, you can't store anything in the attic. Uh, and, and really the attic, arguably should have access only for a you know mechanical piece of equipment and that is it um so no storage and certainly no things like drop ceilings below it i've run into that on commercial projects as well if you need that and honestly i would say one of the real virtues of foaming the roof line is you can have condition storage which you know might be valuable to people you need to pony up for the cost of a spray on intumescent coating and I couldn't find a residential picture, but you see some guy installing it here. And so an intumescent coating is gonna add to the cost. 
but it is going to essentially act as if it was the thermal barrier. So we'll see if we have other questions on that at the end. Um, also talking about combustion equipment. You cannot do a unvented attic assembly and then try to use that combustion air for, uh, you know, you know, burning, you know, gas water heater, gas uh, furnace in this example. So you can absolutely do this. Uh, uh, sorry, you can do this. I went too far. You can do this. You can do a, you know, a direct vent seal combustion approach, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and or a heat pump. Let's face it; these are great for all electric homes. Um, so, you know, uh, a great option. Um, you cannot say, oh, I'm going to put in high-low vents into this because all of a sudden now you're taking an unvented attic and you're making it vented. Um, so you just, you got you to gotta take a systems approach with spray foam and, and combustion equipment inside. But, you know, you can, put a, you can put a tankless gas water heater up there or get a tank gas. As long as it's this type of combustion, it's fine. As long as it's a direct vent, no problem. So. Um, to wrap us up, just kind of say there are alternative methods, many of which we've touched on. And Joey, anything you want to kick in here, please jump in with. Yeah, this is just the the picture that we often see. One of the big trade organizations use this one, and I'm not in love with it. <laughs> I'm not in love with the idea of it or the, the execution of it, but it's there. You can do an air permeable insulation like we talked about earlier. That's going to allow air to pass through it. Uh, does not stop airflow. So you have to make sure that you uh, address your air barrier separately with these. Yep, and and of course, uh, like I said, make sure you have your condensation break, um, or theoretically a vapor vent in climate zones one through three. But I would I would go with a condensation break, and that should be outboard of the air permeable insulation. Um, and you know you can also uh, you can dense pack or or net and blow like we see here. And again, I think this is a really great uh, detail for a um, for a uh, hybrid approach where you'd come in and spray. A, you know, a, a closed cell foam, for example, and then put your netting and then pack that wall full of other insulation. Uh, anything you want to add on knee walls in particular, Joey? Yeah, it's not necessarily uh, specific to air permeable. You can definitely mess up the knee wall when you're using spray foam as well. Just always <laughs> keep that in mind. And I think um, our um, field guy does a great job of showing, just diagramming out exactly what you need. Again, if, if you're using an air permeable insulation, uh, then you still need to add some sort of sheathing or rigid foam board to act as an air barrier on the attic side. 10-4, absolutely. And uh, again, um, I, I keep pitching, I personally like a hybrid approach because you kind of get the best of all worlds. This looks more like a floor, but it could just as easily be a vaulted ceiling. And if it's a vaulted ceiling and your finished ceiling is flat, that's fine. I believe you can leave this exposed. Um, and if you're going to cathedralize it, then you would just come and put drywall on the bottom of this. And that is a great assembly right there. I really like this approach. So kind of gives everybody the best of all worlds. Again, I think we've covered this. We would say closed cells a better fit. Also, just want to make a pitch. Um, we talked about this in, I think it was webinar number four. Uh, but, you know, ResNet has some new standards about how to determine sort of go, no go or grade, grade one or two on the quality of installed insulation. And so they've got some information on that and check that out. And then there's also some other products if you want to go sort of the hybrid approach or, or you know, just other things that can that are kind of similar and that they're sprayed on to provide an air sealing benefit. But then you're going to use another type of insulation, um, the sprayable cocks. Uh, I, th um, this is probably Owens Corning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what, what gave remember, it away? I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's Energy Complete, and I'm not – I, assuming that's still on the market. Um, and there's also this fairly new thing called aero barrier, which can essentially miss, you pressurize the house at a certain point in construction and it mists an aerosol into the air. And as it goes out a leak, it sort of sticks to the edge of the leak and it, and it basically you run it and, and it closes up the leaks and it really does work. Um, it's kind of like fix a flat. So it, it's a neat concept that's out there. Um, also, as I talked about, this whole idea of using nail base, and we're we're wrapping up here. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're, we're right on time, <laughs> on time, on budget, Joey. Uh, you can use the roof deck uh, itself can be air sealed with a product like the Zip system. Um, you can use a nail base product um, like we saw, and um, and uh, again, you know, the, you got to get the details right on this, uh, but it, it's just uh, another way to kind of get to the finish line. And anything you want to add on that, Joey? I want to make sure. I eat. 
Yeah, but, absolutely. Uh, I get this question a lot with the trade-offs. You know, I, you know, I traded down mm -hmm. uh, attic insulation from R38 down to an R20 or an R21. You know, what can I do to make it up? And this is what I generally recommend: is if you spray uh, that um, spray foam against uh, some sort of product like this, you're going to get an extra R5 or even R10. So then your your um, gap you need to cover, you need to trade off, is is a lot lower. Right. Right. And and again. If you do a hybrid approach, this could be by itself your condensate break. So, you know, that could be your condensate break on the outside. And then you just come in with a, another product from underneath. So, again, hopefully we've given you lots and lots of, of ways that you can do a high performance insulated roof line. And notice there, I would say, hopefully you're picking up on my bias towards an unvented uh more or less a conditioned attic space it may not be a finished attic space but a little bit of conditioning in that attic space i'm a big advocate of that we've definitely seen um a little bit of moisture build up in some applications of particularly open cell foam or sip roofs and so a little bit of conditioning i think is fine um and you know again this is uh all good details and uh with that i Think we're probably ready to oh we should pitch this what's on the calendar joey what you want to yeah i, I think we mentioned there. this a little bit earlier i wanted to give it to you in in writing here i think wow. the, date, the dates will be um uh the third thursday 11 a.m eastern uh these topics are, are not necessarily set in stone but i think the first one we'll, we're definitely going to talk about combustion safety um we, you know we've touched on it basically in every webinar that we've done uh, but we want to drive home some of these topics that we've brought up and, and it's not going to be a, you know a field training we're not going to show you how to do the test we're just going to talk about carbon monoxide uh you know and uh, and the things that we do in the house that kind of create these uh, safety issues. So do tune in for that and uh, keep keeping our eye out on our social media. Keep an eye out on your emails. You should get some updates um, on the uh, on the topics and everything there. And and uh, with that, I want to say, is it possible that we've had any questions? And while you're thinking about how you're going to answer that, I want to um, introduce and ask them to unmute themselves. I want to introduce my my friend Phil Brown, um, who I've known for many years and has been a big advocate in helping us in the adoption of energy codes in Georgia. And also Randy Nicholas, who is, I believe, in Columbia, South Carolina. Phil's local in Atlanta um, and um, also has been a, a great technical resource for um, for Isonine and has helped us over over time as well. So guys, welcome and thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. All right. So one, can, yeah, go ahead, Randy. Randy. Yeah. Well, first, I want to I want to ask Randy and Phil to, to to correct all of our misstatements, and by our I mean mostly mine. So, what what sort of uh, amended statements would you like to add? <laughs> I think that's this is Randy. Yeah, that's that's a good way to look at it. Certainly, no corrections, but a couple of things I'd like to highlight as you went through, sort of in uh, the order they were presented. There's you know, five or six, perhaps, and, and Mike, you touched on the HFC uh, blowing agent. And where the industry is going, uh, HFC blowing agents have a fairly high what's called GWP global warming potential, 900 yes. to 1200. Uh, the new HFO foams have a GWP of one. So from a green environment, yeah. that's pretty much where it's going. Washington and California currently uh, have banned the use of HFC blown foams, and we expect that to be going pretty much across Europe's museum for quite a while. It's also known as a uh, fourth generation. Uh, blowing agents. So that's one small point. Um, Great. You talked about the the one option 806.5.5.1, which is where they allow fiberglass uh, up against the roof. That which in Georgia was uh, was not allowed, did not continue through the process. And just a couple of things there. Um, I think theoretically, yes, they can work. And Mike, I think you brought up the point well that there really hasn't been enough worked on it to be sure of that. I'm pretty skeptical. I've been doing building science for 40 plus years and uh, you have to look at all the aspects, especially moisture. Uh, part of the issue was materials uh, using a house wrap. Basically, uh, it's not approved for use on the roof. So there was a kind of a snag in the process on the ICC level as to, okay, what materials can be used it was really never identified. It has to be an approved product. There's no stipulations to what the approval means. Uh, the other thing is, you know, as an ex-roofer through college and so forth, 
uh, you really have to pay attention to the continuous water barrier aspect of that. And like Mike said, you're up on a 12-12 pitch or whatever it is, and making sure that it's watertight is a big deal. The last thing you want is liquid water coming into your assembly. Uh, the other one was uh, conditioning the attic. Mike uh, mentioned that uh, typically there is no supplier return in the attic. Uh, if you keep the RH in the building at the right levels between 40, say 50, 55 percent, uh, we have fairly good communication with that assembly. In some cases, a supply uh, is brought in there. What the code is really specific about is you cannot put a uh, supply and a return, i.e. you cannot circulate air from the attic, an unvented attic, back into the building. So uh, if you put a return in, clearly, uh, if there is a fire event or a smoke event in the attic, that return is yeah. going to bring it throughout the building, and that you can't do. Uh, or if you'd you have to do the that, intermessent, right? Yeah, you'd have to do the intermessent coating in that case. Yeah. yeah. It would have to be a thermal barrier at that point. Once you go to right. storage, all bets are off. You have to go back to a thermal, either sheetrock the attic, which doesn't happen, or an intermessent coating at a fairly thick and fairly costly uh, expense. So that's that's something that's important, but a supply typically is, is allowed. Nobody seems to worry about that, uh, but that's kind of where that fits in. So that's a big issue. Um, the whole also, thing, Randy, the whole thing too, point, Mike. Uh, well, I was just gonna say also too, the, the code was indicating in the neighborhood of 50 CFM per thousand square feet. So we're not talking a lot of supply air in a, in a typical foamed roof line. So, you know, yeah, I think a small amount of supply into that space, you're going to get uh, a, the, the, it will find its way back, you know, to the main part of the house yes. you know, because your flat ceiling is not necessarily super airtight at this point either. So, yeah, gotcha. Keep going. Yeah. And typically, Mike, to go to that point, um, there's, really no reason to seal the two. You really want a communication between the occupied and the unbended attic space. So that kind of lines up with a small amount of supplier, like you say, 50 CFM per thousand square feet. Um, okay, the other thing is open cell, closed cell in the roof line, uh, as you brought up, uh, water, depending on the leak, uh, will come through it. I've had it, unfortunately, in two of my uh, buildings, one I'm in now, uh, with open cell. And it did come down and I saw the uh, stain of the sheetrock and the, uh, a little bit of a pooch in the paint, uh, went up and found it. Uh, it was just a cleat that someone had knocked loose on the roof when they were working on my solar panels. Uh, but mm. the other thing is that it can dry to the inside. Uh, it is not totally vapor open, but it will allow drying to the inside. So uh, that's a good thing. And that's one of the advantages, certainly in our climate, the hot, humid climates, uh, is having that come in. And actually, quite frankly, it's, it's good in the colder climates up there. An open cell would require a vapor uh, barrier paint on the foam to comply with the code for vapor diffusion. Right. Uh, the, the other one you brought up, Mike, which is good, is the VOCs. We got a lot of calls. I, I sit on the technical line all over the U.S. and actually most of the world. Uh, there's a thing called uh, UL Green Guard Gold. It's a testing uh, program for all building materials, and uh, many of the foams that are out there, and you can if they're Green Guard Gold or not. What that implies is that it's the lowest amount of VOCs, the, the, the least amount coming out. A lot of the uh, catalysts have been changed to what we call reactive catalysts, so the VOCs are given off right away. Basically, we flush it out with high rates of ventilation, and uh, in some products, again, this is generic, uh, many products, uh, you can have people without PPP in there within an hour of the finish of the spraying and two hours for reoccupancy. That's how clean some of the foams, not all, but if they're Green Guard Gold, basically right. at the end of the years there's nothing detectable so again we, we see a lot of that concern and uh 24 hours it, it has been this the standard uh it's really all a matter of the testing and the chemistry on like you say the b side that makes that happen uh Excellent. the other one i had was the thickness of spray uh open cell foams can literally be sprayed uh, up to 20 inches in one pass wow it's sort of cumbersome uh, there is the exothermic reaction on the open cell foam is very low. It's much higher on the closed cell. It's a higher, has a higher R value. Many of the foams now, closed cell foams, again, not all, can be sprayed up to seven inches in one pass. So it just depends on the product. Uh, okay. If they have a low exothermic reaction and it's formulated that way, uh, that can be done. It saves on time. You don't have to let it cool, move down the assembly come back with your scaffolding and spray the second or third layer. So it just depends on the product. 
So that Got was it. another small comment. Um, talked about that. Um, I, I think one of the things you brought up towards the end, which I really agree with, and is something I've been big on the entire time I've been uh, with the company, is training and certification of installers. Uh, when we started, I started with Iceneen back when there were five people in the company. And the idea of going to a commodity-based product like closed cell phone just really wasn't my idea of a good thing to do. So uh, been involved with, you know, certifying training, education, you know, knowledge is power. And it's really important. This stuff is technically difficult. It's not a matter of just grabbing a couple of 55-gallon drums and going out and spraying. It's a matter of knowing what you're doing. It's got to be done right. Uh, it's a huge aspect. And I've always said in the seminars that I do, if you have a good product and a bad installer, it becomes a bad product. So as we all know, there's a lot to getting it in there and the details and understanding uh, how things work. So um, let's see. Last thing again, these are not corrections. They're just things that I, I typically no, this is would. Great. Yep. Uh, air barriers, and that's an important thing. Open cell phones typically become air impermeable uh, at three inches. So that's always yes. a minimum to get the air barrier in. Closed cell, inch and a half. The inch and a half thickness on a closed cell also gives you that class two vapor diffusion retarder or the old vapor barrier uh, less than one perm. So those are just some lines in the sand to think about when you're looking mm -hmm. especially at hybrid. Uh, the, the word flash and bat, <clears throat> I mean the term flash and bat, I think the issue there is the flash coating. Uh, as you well brought up, the uh, the dew point issue is a big deal. You don't want the air moving through the air in, the air permeable insulation and just fitting a thin coat where the inside temperature of that foam is below the dew point of the interior air. That's a big deal. So yes. hybrid, yes, not so much like the term flash and bat. That's all I have. Fair I enough. hope that wasn't too much. I guess uh, what oh, I had great. I'm checking off my list as Randy went down his and he's covered. Most of everything, but that flash and bat is important because sometimes flash is seen as a real thin layer. It can be less than a half inch and it won't be an air barrier. So you'd have to make sure it's at least mm -hmm. the thickness if you're doing a flash and bat like you're describing, Mike, to make sure it's at least the thickness of the closed cell foam to where it is an air barrier. But I would speak to uh, another piece on uh, open cell versus closed cell foam. I, open cell is probably predominant in the Southeast US for a lot of the reasons that Randy talked about. Uh, it's vapor permeable, therefore it can have potential to dry uh, easier than open cell if if need be. Uh, but also open cell is roughly installed for the same R value, one half the cost of closed cell foam. So yep. uh, that's that's going to be the biggest predominant reason. But it can do a really effective job. So both that so you'd, maybe you need right at two inches of closed cell to be R13. You need three and a half of open cell. But even though you need more foam, it's going to be about half the cost, install cost versus the closed cell. So it's it's going to be a little more predominant out there from, from that standpoint. So just wanted to throw that out there as well. And and also Fantastic. where the costs have gone, where the things you don't have to do in the code from some of the ceiling that you'd have to do otherwise, from some of those things you, yep. you don't have to do in the HVAC downsizing that you really want to do when you have a tighter envelope. Uh, we'll see homes that'll be 2,500 square foot homes sometimes that when you take all the deducts you don't have to do because the spray foam and an unvented attic gives you, you can get the cost down, difference down to where it used to be, four or 5,000 plus dollars down to where it's a, less than a couple thousand dollars, sometimes less than a thousand dollars. And that's why you see some of the production builders uh, uh, starting to go with the standards that you're seeing in the market now because it's becoming very affordable with open cell foam and the roof line. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you both. Great comments. And and uh, Joey, any um, you want to uh, ask us any questions or let's see what our guests have to say? Yeah, so we did have a couple questions. Um, one I'm kind of curious about uh, when we talked about thermal barriers, are those required when you use the hybrid system? You still you always have to have a thermal barrier that is the not again, like Mike said, temperature a fire barrier, if you may, between the foam and the interior, somewhere in the assembly. So if you're using a hybrid, somewhere mm -hmm. between that hybrid foam and the interior of the building, uh, there would have to be a prescriptive, either prescriptive or an intumescent uh, coating on it, correct? Okay. And, and just, again, it's kind of confusing because of what we're saying in a, in a hybrid approach. The insulation product is not, solve, not serving as the thermal barrier, um, which really is hard for me to say that, um, but it's, 
thermal in the context of the fire mm -hmm. code. So, right. Yeah. Uh, and one um, thing, uh, Mike, you had a uh, a slide that showed, say, in a subfloor, as if I feel I believe that's what you're showing, that had a flashing back kind of scenario with closed cell phone and then fiberglass below it. Well, if that was going to be an exposed space and not have sheetrock underneath that fiberglass, if it did not have it, the fiberglass yeah. would not qualify as the thermal barrier, and you would have that's in that case, so you'd have to have the sheetrock to be able to be the thermal barrier separating. Correct the foam plastic from the interior of the from envelope. the living space below it say yeah yep yes. good point good point all right we have we have a couple of our friends from alabama both in birmingham and mobile who are concerned about termite bonds so uh, i think oh, uh, mike and i have been talking about this for um you know a week or so uh any thoughts concerns questions experiences to to uh, share with us on regarding uh termite bonds uh, yes, I do. Um, somehow I've become the termite uh, guy. Joey's for, for kicking out a little bit there. Mike, go ahead, and then I'll fill in what you guys have been kind of approaching and, and kind of how it breaks down. Well, I, I, just, I heard a. Yeah, um, uh, uh, he's probably listening. Uh, a friend um, sent me an email saying, I can't believe this situation, but I guess there was a home that um, had a ground source heat pump in it and it had been sized correctly because of the foamed roof line. And the person had it installed and was very happy with it. Uh, uh, passed away, and then his heir went to sell the house, and no one would give him a termite letter. And it's just, you know, it's in southern Alabama, and uh, you know, unfortunately, this is we've run into this kind of thing before in Georgia over a decade ago with pest control industry and things like insulated crawl space walls. And I, I think we have to. We have to get industries to work together. And I know, Randy, you and Phil have been gracious in trying to work with the pest control industry. Um, I think the key is we, we got to come up with a method. Everybody gets what they want. I, I, I feel like um, foaming a roof line uh, should not be, uh, you know, there's no, re you know, they, they said they couldn't find a, a pest control company that would do this in Southern Alabama. I'm like, well, look elsewhere, I guess would be my comment. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that's a lot simpler said than done. It's a real situation, but this is a case of two industries need to work together more. And 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 if the pest control people need something, let's work with them. It, it does not have to be a monolithic all or none, like no spray foam is allowed kind of thing. And, and that's unfortunately what happened to this particular homeowner that they ended up paying to rip out the foam insulation and um, and to ha then had to upsize the mechanical system because they are now undersized. I mean, that's wrong. That's just wrong. Um, it's a it's a nightmare story. I believe it's true. But that's a case of where, you know, we're not we're not finding the solution. Uh, any comments on that, Randy? Yeah, and, and Mike said it right off the bat. As you know, we went through what we called the bug wars in the last go around with the uh, Georgia uh, code cycle and came up with a compromise. Uh, and so, what we're looking at now, the SPFA, Spray Polyurethane Foam Alliance, and the NPMA, the National Pest Management Association, uh, have been working together. Uh, it's been kind of a long road, so to speak. Yeah. We met about a year, year and a half ago, and working towards a compliance document where we both sides agreed as to what would be acceptable for one, our side, the energy side, and the spray foam, and the inspection side of the pest management. And that is still ongoing. I wish it was, uh, we would have been further along except for COVID 19. We had several meetings uh, together to come, at least in the state of Georgia, to come together and find a middle ground. Uh, that has not happened because the meetings were canceled. Uh, we are re-energizing those. Those are coming up again uh, as part of the new Georgia Code, uh, something to as an, use as an amendment. So, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, both sides need to get there. And we, I've made a lot of inroads. I've done presentations with the NPMA, kind of not explaining our side of the story, but looking at the energy side and how we can work together. Um, and I believe we'll come to a solution. We're not there yet, unfortunately. Yeah. I would like to report that it's a done deal, but it is certainly not. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now. Uh, and that kind of situation you mentioned a minute ago, Mike, and you sent me the email. Yeah, that's that's awful. Uh, a lot of times what we'll do is suggest that, well, find if you can find another pest management company uh, yeah. is an option. Uh, and, and 
and kind of work that out. Some of our spring foam companies are actually starting new pest management as a result of that. We have several nice. in nice. that I've heard about and talked to, and they're doing both sides of the equation. So uh, yeah. I don't know what the solution is. I'd like to say, yeah, let's do it, do it this uh, way or that way, and for both. And right now, we don't have that. I don't want to. I don't want to throw the pest control industry under the bus. They're they're not represented here. But I I I definitely have run into this before. Uh, over many years ago and multiple times where they seem to kind of operate in a vacuum to some extent and um you know we went through a lot with crawl space and basement wall insulation and and eventually we we were able to to hammer out you know um a solution that that was acceptable to everybody and it's it, and i think that's ultimately what we're coming to but you know what a mess and i, I just feel like um it's it's really wrong that this industry can stop a million dollar real estate transaction with very little in at least historically very little building science knowledge i mean this is the this is the same industry that was trying to uh, promote venting crawl spaces and and the, and you go why well i don't know you know but but anyway so i, I don't want to sound like i'm throwing them under the bus uh, it, this is my past trauma, traumatic experiences with them. But I do think that we've also met up with some folks that are much more enlightened and much more willing and understand the need to find this uh, compromise approach. So I, I, you know, I definitely have some very good pest control industries that I'm, I'm uh, that actually understand that we all have to work together on this. All right, Mike, while you're throwing industries under the bus, yeah, yeah, um, good, you good. want to talk a little bit about shingle manufacturers. Have you had any issues with those types of uh, warranties being voided for uh, this was specific to the unvented um, uh, assembly? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's um, it's gotten better uh, on this front. And I'm going to say that this has everything to do with a manufacturer just deciding how they want to write a warranty and it has nothing to do with physics. So I'm going to lay that out up front that venting or no venting uh, under a sloped roof, for example, with shingles on it, um, the venting has so um poco minimal impact on the life of the shingle that, you know, if you want to give it 1% impact on, on shingle life, you know, okay, 2%, whatever, but it's, it's very, very minimal impact on the, the the life of the shingle and joey i'm going to tell the story about how that time you were lying down on a cardboard tape on, on a uh, card table um in the middle of a parking lot and just laid on your belly all day and and uh were you naked for this one i don't remember but the sun kind of went over the whole the sun passed over you all day and you were quite sunburnt but we had a fan blowing air underneath that table did that did that keep you from getting sunburned and the answer is no so shingles die because of solar radiation. And um, having said that, if a manufacturer of, let's say, this is my understanding of a predominantly pink color insulation, chooses to say, we're not gonna offer a warranty because, unless the roof is vented, that's their choice. You can either switch to a different manufacturer of shingles that happens to also sell spray foam and they're happy for it to be unvented. So it has nothing to do with physics. And generally, if you tell the pink manufacturer you're going to switch to the other manufacturer, they'll say, oh, no, no, we'll still give you the warranty. So it's just kind of a it's a real um, more political issue. It has nothing to do with physics. The physics are that venting under roof decking has very, very minimal impact, if any at all, uh, on the life of the shingle. Same for radiant barriers. We get that same question with radiant barriers. I would say that seems to be somewhat fading away. Um, to some extent, we don't seem to get those questions as much anymore. That that's been my experience. Anybody else want to comment? Mike, I'd yeah. add in. This is Phil. Uh, that uh, the the without naming names of companies, but the top <laughs> three single manufacturers are all fully understanding and have it within their technical bulletins that recognize that code compliant unvented attics. Uh, are acceptable within their warranties. There are there are some shingle manufacturers that still want to push back, but it's the vast majority. If you take those top three, and I bet it's over 90 plus percent of asphalt shingles okay. are covered underneath that. So, and then specialty shingles and high-end premium type of products uh, that are out there now that are also fully accepting of the code-approved unvented acts. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, Mike, just to, I deal with this quite a bit. Um, 
kind of where all the testing came out. Most of us remember SIPS panels. They're still around, but uh, yep. when they were so, out there, yep. invented assembly for sure. The whole hysteria back 25 years ago now was they'll cook yep. the shingles yep. and huge failures and da da da. Well, Florida Solar Energy Center, FESSEC, did a whole series of testing. Armin Rudd did it, and they found out the maximum difference between a vented and an unvented uh, attic assembly or a roof assembly, excuse me, was about six, six to seven degrees which the north face versus the south face of a, a building has a much more uh, a, a larger effect on the warranty yeah. and the other thing too is most of the manufacturers what they state in their technical bulletins again there's like phil said three or four of the main ones as long as it's done to code which it would be and along with the uh, properly installed according to the uh, insulation manufacturers instructions they're good to go, so to speak. It's a little more yeah. technical than yeah. that, but that's kind of yeah. where it sits in. And then the third thing is that really what the warranty and a roofing, uh, and it, it's in there, you read warranties, which are really boring for the most part. Uh, <laughs> it says basically about manufacturing defects. What you put under the roof or not, bended or not bended, doesn't have anything to do with a manufacturing defect. But again, most of the big boys are doing it, some are not. Uh, and like, well, I just suggest, well, find another shingle. They, are, they pretty much are fairly similar in color and uh, uh, yeah. you can find them. They will typically send out the uh, technical bulletins. And what happens a lot of times is they manufacture with their tech bulletins says, yep, we'll do it along with these conditions, but the, the memo doesn't get down to the local salesman or certainly the installer and they go, no, we can't do it. Well, then we kind of hopefully redirect them back, send them the bulletin and Sometimes it works out, other times they'll change to another manufacturer. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the SIP thing too, because I remember that our South Face building was built in 1996, so that's 24 years ago, and it has an unvented uh, SIP roof assembly, and next to it is a vented garage assembly, and we used to, it was great, because we just point to it and say, do you see any difference in the shingles? And the answer was no, so that's a good point. Anything else, Joey? Yeah, um, I think we can wrap it up with this one last question. We had a couple people that were interested in this. You, uh, Mike, you mentioned that um, you had uh, uh, someone, a friend of yours, I believe, that um, was doing a uh, install, and and you suggested they go back and redo the master bedroom, I believe. In, in that case, um, would you spray over the old? Uh, would you rip it out? What would you do there? Good. I'm gonna let our experts answer that. Yeah, it, it can be sprayed over. Uh, you can add to it. It will stick to itself, cohesion. Uh, so, and that's typically done if someone's, you know, didn't quite get it. And the inspector doesn't like a certain area. The installer will come back and uh, put more foam in. Or if there's a void, they missed something, they couldn't get the right angle with the gun, uh, and it's detected. Hopefully, uh, then it can be sprayed upon. So, yeah, it will stick to itself. Absolutely. Thank you. That's what I was going to say, but it sounds more important coming from you. Uh, All right. Well, the, there's still a couple more questions out there. As always, we've got several email addresses for you to send questions to. So, um, you, you know, some, some, what's that? I was going to say, can you put up the last slide with everybody's emails address on it um, yeah, besides us? Do that. Um, because I want to make sure people can get a hold of Randy and Phil directly. And uh, guys, I can't thank you enough. Um, I don't know if we're wrapping or not, but uh, really appreciate your time. And um, I have. I reached out to Phil because I have known him for many years and, you know, he's not, he's not, uh, he's obviously believes in his product, but he's always, I, I feel like, um, shared information in a way that's not making outrageous claims. And, uh, you know, I, it happens in any industry. Uh, I, I didn't mention this, but, you know, there are people out there that talk about the magic foam that it, you know, one inch of my magic foam is as good as R30 and all that. And these guys, Randy and Phil, I think, you know, really try hard to to provide the technical rigorousness to, to and, and and to try to get re people not to make these outrageous claims um, and try to provide the real data and the real performance. So I thank you guys very much for that. Thanks, sir. Yeah, Mike, just to comment on that, we we a lot of people say, oh, this is equivalent to that. You know, R20 is equivalent to a 38 R. Value. No, R value is R value. Performance yep. is a different thing. So. We just, you know, they, they they get really zealous and I'm happy they're, you know, ready to go, but we, we, we got to nip that in the bud. There is no magical chart. I wish there was, but under performance, <laughs> as we know, with all the things you brought up, it is quote unquote, the equivalent 
energy performance, but not the equivalent R value. Right, right. Um, any uh, Joey, anything else? I'm gonna give you the last little the wrap up here. Um, and uh, I definitely want to put pitch. Um, please join us. And I guess uh, is it three weeks? I think it's three weeks. We'll be doing one on combustion safety. I think it'll be fun. I've got lots of great stories. I can't wait to share on that. And then if you need a fix of more building science stuff, we're doing those great webinars for EBA. Go to EBA.org and it should pop up on their website. Yeah, I put that in the chat. So if anyone's interested in that Herds Associate class, EBA.org, uh, there's a link in the in the chat. So uh, if you if you haven't if you're not tired of hearing Mike's voice by now, uh, many yeah, more opportunities to do so. <laughs> I know I'm, uh, you're tired of talking, so. Uh, alrighty. Well, thanks everyone for uh, joining us here. Webinar number nine. We'll see you again in about three weeks on June 18th. Uh, so please join us for that. Uh, thank you very much and hope you have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks again. Thank you.